Now, last week, somebody asked me about a prenup. I forget what the fuck I said, but uh, you, you listeners did not agree with me. Um, so here we go. Prenups. Decent argument. Hey, Billy, blank balls. What do you mean blank balls? I just had a fucking kid. How dare you? Late in the game, too. Uh, not a lady here, but I have recently heard a good argument in favor of prenups when extreme wealth is involved. I got to be honest with you. I kind of feel like in the future... Um, as women start to make the same amount of money as men, then they're going to be all about prenups because we know how it works with them, right? We know how it works with them. It's, it's, they have to be happy. So if all of a sudden enough women start fucking having to pay fucking child support and alimony, they're going to be like, wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We need to take a look at what's going on here. Right, ladies? Right? They're going to do that shit. But that, that doesn't exist right now. So anyway, firstly, the argument shies away from the situation where a, where a lack of trust is present between the partners. Rather, it presents the real risk of predatory family members of which they may have and lack control over. Oh, so you take the focus off of her and put it on her fucked up family? How does that work? These people come out of the woodwork and can destabilize newlyweds where extreme wealth is involved. Prenup for situations like these can probably be the difference between lasting marriages and divorces within a year. Also, many prenups have degenerative qualities that make them meaningless after X amount of years. Thanks a lot for everything. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what you're saying, but there, there's a lot of loopholes in that. Um, but, you know, I guess you can do it. You know, I don't know. You should have like a prenup that protects whatever you had before you got together. Because how it works is whatever you did while you were with that person, they get all the credit, which is hilarious. It's fucking hilarious. If they weren't at your job doing the shit, it's fucking hilarious. Well, so I was at home watching the kids. Well, I could have fucking hired a nanny, a full-time fucking nanny that, that, that wouldn't, you know, at the end of her j- time working with me, want to take half of whatever the fuck I created at work. All right, prenups. Dear Bill, you pale Irish redheaded bitch boy. Jesus Christ. Um, I heard your response to the guy who wrote in about the prenup, and you have it all wrong as usual. <laughs> Maybe I do that on purpose to keep, uh, to keep listeners. Um, sure, there are women who you refer to as predators, but that's not the norm. How the fuck do you know? Do you date women? Um, what's more, I'm assuming this is a woman. I shouldn't do that. What's more likely to happen is this guy will continue to kill it with his business and years of resentment will slowly build about some bullshit like they do in all marriages and things will fall apart. That's not her being a predator. That's just life. Wait a second. Wait a second. So, if... One person is killing it in the marriage and the other person resents them for it. That's not the resentful person needing to work on themselves. That's just life. Are they ever held responsible for anything? Jesus Christ. It's like how many guys does Wilson have to hit on the ice and still get the fucking capitals on a fucking power play? It's unbelievable. Uh, That's not her being a predator, just life. So this poor bastard will work his tail off, giving her a great life, and she'll be pissed about some bullshit and things will fall apart. Either way, this guy is getting screwed, I guess. I make way more money than my wife and resent her every day for it. So I guess that shit goes both ways. Oh, you resent her? Yeah. Yeah, because you still this like, uh, dude, I, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Better advice would have been don't get married before you're 40. Well, I at least did that. Also, Boston is a dirty place and go fuck yourself. Um, I actually have a fucking theory that. Um, that like, I think women always look for a problem in the relationship because it's how they maintain a sense of control because if it's just going well and you're doing well and you don't have anything to work on um or you guys don't have anything to work out they i think they feel like there's no connection there you're gonna get bored or whatever um but 
you know, my wife is amazing, but I've even had to have those conversations. It's like, can I go three days without being in the doghouse? I mean, I, like, what is the fucking problem? Look at that flat screen TV. Huh? What is the fucking problem? I tell shit jokes and we get to live here. What is the problem? I know, sorry. And then they do that and then, yo, oh, everything's great. And you're fucking sharing a malt, you know what I mean? Or some spaghetti to bring back Lady and the Tramp and then like fucking three days later. Okay, you know, I just want to say. <laughs> uh, you just want to just stick them in a hamper, close the lid. Um, Dirty Harry. Dear Billy Color Truck Burr, uh, I am from India. What's going on? I fucking love you people. Um, that's like progressive and uh, offensive all at the same time. I was just thinking about you guys today. You guys, meaning people from India. How much fun I had over there. What like next level ball breakers you are. Oh, I know what it was. I saw yet another white chick bitching or whatever. And I, w- I have like this theory, you know, it's not even a theory. It's like actually a fact. Like the more oppressed you are, the funnier you are. You're just fucking funny. You know? White women, generally speaking, they're not really breaking up the party. <laughs> I go over to India. Everybody over there packed in like sardines. You guys were fucking hilarious. Um, oh, I divide on this podcast. I am from India and I have been a huge fan of the podcast, which is what is keeping me sane in these times. Heard you mention the dirty, dirty Harry. Now, by the way, when I say white women, I'm not talking about comedians before you guys try to turn this into some shit. I'm just talking about, you know, the white broads in the, in the crowd, just getting all offended and all of that crap. And I'm not talking about all of them. I'm just talking about the loud ones. Um, heard you mention dirty mentioned the Dirty Harry series in the last episode and was wondering whether you knew it was based on a true story. And he writes, yeah, it's about the Zodiac Killer and how the police tried to solve the mystery and also other such cases from the past, from 1981 Germany and 1972 Victoria, uh, uh, Australia. The Callahan character in Dirty Harry seeks out a psycho killer, serial killer like the Zodiac Killer in the movie as well. Um... That movie was shot in 1970. When was the Zodiac Killer? I don't even know. You also see the Dirty Harry movie being referenced in the Zodiac movie, which came out in 2007. Also, since you mentioned the 40 drives in Dirty Harry, thought you might find it cool to know about Clint Eastwood's car collection. I would. Actually, and I had it wrong. That that Plymouth satellite that he drove through the front of the fucking liquor store in the beginning was uh that was just a car he trashed he drove another ford i forget what it was in um in the uh what was that one called the enforcer uh clint eastwood's car collection will make your day all right let me see it ford roadster 1932 is he a ford guy just when i couldn't love this guy anymore Lincoln K series convertible, 1937. Now, he's born in 1930. So these are all the, the cars from his uh, childhood. Austin Healey, 100M. I don't know what that means. 1955. Can I get some pictures here? Cadillac Eldorado series 62. I already know what that one looks like. Convertible, 1955. Oh, because I'm on the wrong fucking... Christ, is he on that internet? I'm on the wrong fucking... Wi-Fi here. All right, let's see what I got here. There we go. Look at Clint. How could this guy not be a fucking movie star? Um, 1932 Roadster. Look at that badass thing. I can't believe he can get in there. Guy's like 6'4". I don't have too much of a man crush on him. Lincoln K F- Series Convertible. It's like a classic, you know, that's either a mob boss or the mayor of a filthy town car. Um, Austin Healy, that 55 is amazing. Amazing car. Yep, and that Cadillac Eldorado Series 62, 1955 is one of the best-looking Cadillacs ever made. Two-door. God, that's gorgeous. Gorgeous car. Jaguar XK150 Roadster, 1960. My favorite Jag is the one that Steve McQueen had in the 1950s, whatever that one is. Morris Mini Countryman Cooper, 1966. This is, a, this is a real car guy that if you have this thrown in there. 
Ferrari 275 GTB 1966. I don't know much about the Ferraris other than the ones from the 60s are like priceless. Grand Torino Sport. Oh, that's what he had. He had a Grand Torino. That's right. He had a Grand Torino in um, the Enforcer. And he was, you know, he wasn't into like women's lib. He just kept going, well, isn't that fancy? And then years later, he's just, you know, get off my lawn in Gran Torino. How cool is that? I wonder if he used his actual car for the movie. Uh, Ferrari 365, 365, GT4, Berlinetta Boxer, 1974. Pontiac Special Edition Trans Am, 1977. I wonder what the special edition was. That's the, uh, the Burt Reynolds one. Ferrari 308 GTB, 1978. GMC Typhoon, 1992. What the fuck is that? A few years ago on Jimmy Fallon's The Tonight Show, Eastwood was asked what he drives. Uh, This is in GQ magazine. I'm going to read this. I don't have time to go through all this. He's got a Fiat 500E. I love that fucking car. I think that's all the cars. That's amazing. That is really amazing. Um, Anyways, that's on GQ magazine, the UK edition. Dirty Harry. um, Dirty Harry. Clint Eastwood's uh, car collection. Anyway, anyways, that's it. Just thought it might be fascinating to share the above. Big fan. Love the podcast. Thanks and go fuck yourself. All right. Refuse to touch laptop. Dear Billy Booberry, a few days ago, (laughs) because I'm white as a ghost, is that what that is? A few days ago, I was at my friend's, and he asked me to search from something on YouTube on his computer. I flat out said, no, I'm not touching your jizz machine. He got all offended, like I was saying he jerked off for an unreasonably or unhealthy amount. I told him that wasn't the case. I know he doesn't clean his keyboard, and he most likely is 99.99% of humans who jerk off to porn. How is this not a widely acknowledged thing? I'm not going to use your toothbrush. I'm not going to let you fuck my wife, and I'm not touching your computer is what you should have wrote. You said your toothbrush. Thoughts? Dude, I think think you're on the cutting edge. The cutting edge. I think that's a great fucking point. I want people out there who, uh, who, who are these people? People who work on computers. I mean, you got to, you can't tell me that you don't fucking, you must wipe it down away like those fucking, I'm going to commit a murder gloves. Um, that's a great point. I'll tell you what's nuts was back in the day, used to use a pay phone. I, in New York City, I'd take a pay phone, stick it right to my fucking ear. Um, that, uh, the, the mouthpiece touching my lower jaw. Awful. Girlfriend's ex is a pro athlete. Hey, Billy Bongo tits. Jesus Christ, I'm getting trashed here. Uh, I'm a 21-year-old guy living in Canada. I'm dating this amazing, beautiful, smart girl with a great sense of humor. Uh, We have been great together for about six months, and it's going great. We're getting more serious, so she has been digging into... So we have been digging into each other's past, and she tells me that her ex is a pro hockey player. He's a very high-profile player, and he is quite well-known, especially here in Canada. She started dating him throughout high school. Ah, okay. Whether her ex is playing in town, he will... Whenever his ex is playing in town, he will send my girl's mom tickets for the hockey game. Apparently, this guy and my girl's mom get along really well. A little too well. No. She hasn't gone to a game in over a year. She has been totally faithful, and I have zero fear she will cheat or anything like that. She really is amazing. I absolutely hate that her ex is this famous, good-looking, fit millionaire. I'm definitely a good-looking guy, but I'm no pro athlete. My girl doesn't bring him up at all, but she works hard on our relationship. I know it's not fair to her, but I can't help thinking that she sees me in no way as good as her ex. Well, dude, I mean, if that's what she thought, then she would dump your ass in a minute and at the very least try to go land another hockey player. Hanging out at games, I think. Anyways, not to get all depressing, but I don't know how to compete. On top of all that, I cringe whenever I'm watching hockey now. Am I just crazy to be thinking like that? I would definitely say I have lots of self-confidence. I have never had an issue with comparing myself to people, but this guy is really getting to me. Your advice would be great. Thanks and go fuck yourself. Uh, You got to work your way through that, man. 
if she's not going with this guy or any of that type of shit. Um, you know, you know what I would do? I would start working on yourself. You become an even better version than you are right now. I mean, there's a reason why they broke up. For all you know, she just thinks the guy's a douche. Maybe he's great at this one thing and he sucks at being a boyfriend or whatever. I think it's a great thing that uh, despite the fact him being famous and being a great looking guy and a pro athlete, you know, if she walked away from that thing, then um, obviously she knows that, you know, money and looks and that thing, you know, are not all that it's cracked up to be. So what I would do is I'd go out there, you know, hit the gym a little harder, work on yourself. You know, if you got any fucking issues that might fuck up the relationship, I I don't know what to tell you. I've never been in that situation, but I got to say, if she's not going to games and she doesn't seem to give a fuck, um, you know, but I get it. I get it. That guy's just out there circling like a shark right on your flat screen TV every fucking night. That's got to be tough. So I do have empathy for you. But what I would do is I would, that's just one of those things like I have no fucking control over that. So whatever, who gives a fuck? You live once. Throw yourself in this relationship. Be a great boyfriend. If she fucking dumps you for uh, whoever the fuck this guy is, then what are you going to do? What are you going to fucking do? You know what you do? You then go out and put out a hit album like that fucking chick over there in England. You know? That chick, that whatever, whatever. I always forget her fucking name. Done it from the other side. Whatever the, that song. That fucking huge voice, man. Amazing, amazing singer. And she's funny as hell, too. What the fuck? You know, she got dumped. So there you go. Hang with this chick. And then someday when she breaks up with you, you write the mail. Alanis Morris set album. That's what you do. Mr. Duplicity. Um, be funny if she dumps you and then you just fucking give her shit as she's walking out the door. Like all hockey terms. Yeah, go, yeah, go back to him. Go back. He's a minus six. I'm a plus four, four years of being the best boyfriend you're ever going to have. Right? Just <laughs> go down swinging. All right. Dilemma. Uh, hey, Billy Boy Scout. Billy Boy Scout, got a couple of dilemmas for you. One, would you rather have everyone chuckle dismissively at everything you say as if nothing you say is important or never, or never be able to make anyone laugh ever again? Oh, you fucking asshole. You just tied me up in a goddamn... What do I do with that? Uh, I would definitely much rather have the first. Chuckle dismissively. There, I would just... There's no fucking way. I would be crying laughing by the third person. And then what I would do is I would... Then the game would then just be... I would just keep making statements. And the statements would get bigger and bigger and more ridiculous because then their reaction, they should be saying, what the fuck? How the fuck can you say that? But if they're then chuckling dismissively, it then becomes funny for me and then I'm having a great time. That's what it'd be. But to never make anybody laugh again, that's how I connect with people. Um, anyway, he had a number two, but I don't I didn't want to get at that number two one. That one's just crossing the line. Keep it about me, huh, people? Keep it about me. Um, all right, that is the podcast, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I hope you have a wonderful week. It's coming into June. June is right around the corner. Um, my, my, my little boy is, is walking. Dude, he is, he's, I don't want to be the overly proud dad. Kid is jacked. He's got a little physique on him. He's got some shoulders, you know, he's got a little chest on him. I didn't want to say anything. I just saw, yeah, maybe it's kind of baby fat or whatever, just shaped like that, the rolls. And I, all the, all the fucking, you know. All the ladies, you know, mom, mother-in-law, everybody, you know, is going like, he's kind of uh, strong, right? So yesterday, my daughter, right, we had come back. I took her to the park. We were riding bikes and shit, right? And she was sitting there. She had a little <laughs> little thing of snacks. And I, he was whining, wanted to be up on the couch. I brought him on the couch. And he just looked at the snacks. And he just reached out and he just grabbed the bag. And she's going, nobody, no. And he just starts pulling it <laughs> with one hand towards himself. 
And my daughter's trying to pull it back, going, no, 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 no. And he just pulled it and just took it right out of her hand. And then she looks at me, you know, like, can you believe that? And I, and I just said, well, you got to take it back. Don't let people do that to you, right? So, I don't know. He's got like a vice grip on him. He's a little grippy guy. He just fucking grabs onto you. He's got a great sense of humor, and now he's walking. It's hilarious. When he walks, he has his hands up like he's on a roller coaster. You know those people? They put. I don't know why they do it. You put your hands up on a roller coaster. I don't know why. I don't know why people do that. All right. I don't know why people stick their legs out in motorcycle racing when they go around a turn. Balance. I have no idea what it is. But anyways, when he walks, he's got his he's got his hands up. Um. And right now he finally has confidence because he's been walking for about four weeks, and now he's just kind of like, you know, if I uh, he, now he's just like I would rather walk. Then crawl. That's his deal. Um, all right, that is it. That is it. That is the uh, that is the podcast. I hope you guys have a wonderful week. Go fuck yourselves. Go Bruins. What about those Celtics, huh? How about those Celtics? Last game, you know, we finally got those fucking Brooklyn Nets. All right, I mean, I, they know you shouldn't even be called like the Brooklyn Nets. They just this one of those fucking Ocean's Eleven teams, you know. At 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 center, Brad Pitt. Power forward, Matt Damon. Don Cheadle, shooting guard. Get coming. And they still need one more piece. Coming down out of the locker room, George Clooney. One of those fucking teams. Just everybody's a superstar on it. So who knows? Maybe we can win two in this series. We'll see what the fuck happens. Um, just Jason Tatum. I mean, I don't know what you can say. I just wish his partner in crime, uh, Jalen Brown, was there. Because I think we could actually give these guys a series. Uh, but I really miss the days when people took chances on draft picks and there was the excitement to see whether they worked out or not, rather than just raiding somebody else's team as somebody has already proved that they can dominate at the pro level. I just don't see the skill set. There's no salary cap. It's not competition. It's fucking ridiculous. And we're all just sitting around waiting for the Nets to play the Lakers. That's basically what's happening. I'm holding out on Utah to maybe stop the Lakers. We'll see. All right, that's it. I will talk to you guys on Thursday. Thank <laughs> you.